Um, well, we're, we're, we're giving a couple of minutes uh, uh, for other people to show. Why don't I go ahead and um, introduce myself, introduce the organization. I'm Ben Katz. I'm the political director for Open San Diego. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Open San Diego is the local affiliate for Code for America. And uh, our mission, we're a group of volunteers, and what we try and do is help government and nonprofit organizations use technology better. Um, so we've had a series of these events. This is our uh, third Meet the Candidate. Um, thank you, Congressman, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, the goal here today is, is really just to um, have a good conversation, very issue-oriented, uh, a little bit different than probably what you've been hearing on the TV and receiving in your mailboxes, uh, very focused on technology, on open government. Um, it's, uh, uh, Scott Lewis, who is here, accused me of being more wonky than he is. Uh, <laughs> no, he didn't really. You're, you can't be more wonky than Scott Lewis. Um, <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, and uh, I should, should take a quick second here to thank and recognize a few other people. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Robin Whitall and Seth Hall, uh, also with Open San Diego, who really have played a huge role in putting this on. Uh, Glenn with 47 Ronin, uh, who for every one of these events does a great job of putting together a video. Uh, and then of course, uh, the San Diego Foundation, uh, for providing us this great space, and our, our national affiliate, Code for America, for giving us the money to buy the beer, most importantly. Nice. Crucial. <laughs> so, um, I don't see a whole lot of reason to, 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 to delay too much further, so why don't we go ahead and get into it. And again, okay. Congressman, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, and taking for the, the beer. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> Cheers. Um, so, um, you've been in politics in San Diego for a while. <laughs> Uh, I think we have a reasonable sense of who you are, but I think there's a couple of key things about you that we don't know, and so just a, a couple of quick questions to give okay. people a better sense about who you are. First of all, uh, Mac, PC, or Linux? I, I hate to say it, but PC. Uh, it's okay. I, so, I'm mostly a PC guy myself. Uh, favorite brewery in town? I do like the Green Flash uh, West Coast IPA. At my, I don't get to drink a lot of beers, but that's what I tend to choose. We got that on tape. I'm getting a discount next <laughs> yeah. time on the beer. Right. Uh, <laughs> and 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 in fun, do you program or have you ever programmed? I did. I took computer science in um, as a freshman in college, and you you had the cards. You know, we kind of went through this, but <laughs> had a box of cards where you had to uh, program them, and um, I saw a couple of times when people would tumble and. You know, the order of the cards would be all messed up. So I did a little bit of it, um, but uh, I didn't appreciate it when I did it. <laughs> well, that, that, that's it part of, definitely part of the distribution requirement. <laughs> well, 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 you've now given us a sense about your age, too. Yes, so. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, so uh, you were on the Coastal Commission, yep. and then you got elected to City Council? No, so I uh, first I did a 15-year career as an environmental lawyer. Um, in the private sector and the public sector, and then ran for city council in 2000. I was elected from uh, the district, what well, was then District 1, and now it's, uh, um, does it, it included Penasquitos, now, uh, now it just is La Jolla, University City, Carmel Valley, it was then Penasquitos also. Uh, in 2002, the um, speaker then, Herb Wesson, appointed me to the Coastal Commission, and I was served in the Coastal Commission from 2002 to 2005, and I left the Coastal Commission. I didn't know if I was going to be reappointed, but I wanted to try to be the council president, which I was in 2006. And then from there, the Port Commission, right? So after 2008, I joined the Port Commission, did that for four years. I was chair during 2011. And most recently, Congress. Congress, yes. So you've been doing that for a little over a year and a half now? Uh, Almost two years seems like 12. <laughs> and is DC the absolute cesspool that we keep hearing it is? Mostly. <laughs> Mostly. Actually, um, <laughs> so DC is a, is a very, um, I'd say it's a very nice place to visit, and, uh, but it's very much a company town. Uh, and uh, people ask me the most, uh, this is a little bit having to do with in innovation, but people, I give the same answer every time. So people ask me, what's the biggest surprise about DC? And I always say it's the culture. Because in San Diego, it's very, very, second nature for us to be um, collaborative and cooperative and sit around a table and solve problems. And I don't know where you went to school, but I know you're a smart guy. And DC is very hierarchical. So 
I want to know what your rank is. I want to know how long you've been here, who you work for. If you tell me your title, I'll tell you if, if you have a good idea. And it's, that's the least accommodating culture for innovation. And so um, uh, I think that San Diego has a lot to offer. I, I often say in a serious way that we can lead the, the country in a lot of these things, and, um, uh, including in technology. So despite that, you, you do want to go back? I live in San Diego. I visit DC. <laughs> So how often do you, do you travel back and forth? So the schedule is um, generally uh, during a month, we'll have uh, three weeks in, in DC, scheduled in DC and one week in our home districts. But I'm home almost every weekend. We have a lot of four day weekends. I would say one criticism I have of the speaker is he doesn't work us very hard. And in fact, um, he gave us all of August off. Uh, and I, you know, I come home and I work. I, do, I work pretty hard when I'm here. Um, but then uh, two weeks in September, and then called off Congress until after the elections, November 11th. So I think we should be back voting on wildfires, on the budget, on uh, taking care of some of these veterans issues that are still persisting. Uh, but uh, that's not my call to make. So, so when I first started working on, on campaigns, um, I remember we, we had all sorts of issues on, on getting information between DC and the district. I assume with you know modern technology, with the, the internet, with, with broadband, with things like Skype, mm -hmm. that's a lot easier. Are you using those sort of technologies? Do you end up Skyping to your staff in DC and San Diego? Um, do you have, We're have still you? using something, it's a technology called the conference call. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, you know, basically we look at paper, I know what they look like. Um, and uh, you know, I think technology makes everything a lot easier. I think we almost take it for granted how much easier it is to, to trade information. Um, the, the biggest challenge is not technological. The biggest challenge is the time change because by the time uh, people get into work uh, in, um, in San Diego, much of the day has already gone by in D.C. and that's, that's been the bigger challenge. It's also, San Diego is an earlier town than D.C. so there's some accommodation that way. Hmm. Um. And so when, when you're here, what, what do you spend your time? Meeting with constituents, meeting with the press? Well, I'll, you know, the press has only been re recently interested in, in me, so um, that's nice, but uh, I've spent most, I'm, almost all my time uh, trying to meet with constituents and finding out how the federal government's affecting them. Um, I visited, I think, 60 companies last year. I think this year I visited, you know, um, probably an equivalent number. I visited every military base. We have seven military bases in the, or military installations in the district. I visited all those, talked to the generals, the admirals, try to get a sense for what the overlap is between DC and San Diego. So, so of those 60 companies, how many of them were tech? Many, so if you remember, the San Diego economy is powered by three things, tourism, not a lot of federal issues in tourism, but the military and then most of the rest of what the economy is driven by is tech technological. So Qualcomm is the largest private employer. Uh, we're the second or third leading biotechnology company uh, cluster, biotechnology cluster in the country. And today the company I visited was Volcano. That's in Carmel Valley. It does a lot of um, very sophisticated diagnostics on your circulatory system, so the heart and, and, and you know ways to prevent um, heart attacks. Um, we are big in military technology. A lot of the communications across the battlefield, those complicated things are developed here. Cybersecurity today, we kicked off the Cyber Center of Excellence Conference today. That's big here. And obviously unmanned systems or drones. Um, and then clean technology, we're big in, um, we're big solar deployers. We have more electric vehicles per capita here than anywhere in the country. We have, uh, we're big in the smart grid research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that the grid is more reliable and more efficient uh, and uh, wastes less energy. And then the other area is um, algae. We're the center of algae research. And uh, uh, algae can be a feedstock for advanced biofuels. Uh, I am actually the co-chair of the um, Bipartisan Congressional Algae Caucus. <laughs> so there's an algae caucus in Congress. Uh, if they say you can't get a leadership position as a freshman, just tell them about Peters and algae. But um, it's also an opportunity for us because the Navy wants to invest in biofuels in the, in the military, and so a relatively small investment in, um, in alternative energy in the big context of a large military budget could have big commercial implications. And, and so what, what, what is your role? What are you able to do? Are you mostly a, a matchmaker? Are you introducing 
our algae people to, to DOD folks? Is I think um, I think leadership is a lot about about finding where you can make a match. And so I tried to line my service up where Washington intersects with San Diego. So I'm on the Armed Services Committee, mm -hmm. which is logical. The subcommittee is on sea power and on emerging threats, which has been mostly cybersecurity. And then science based and technology, trying to support robust in, uh, investment in basic scientific research um, and just being an advocate um, for uh, innovation and medical research. Now, now this the science and technology committee, that's the one I keep seeing on the Daily Show, right? That is. People make fun of the science <laughs> committee because the, I mean, and I'm not, you know, I try really hard not to be the most partisan uh, Democrat, but a lot of the Republicans, uh, they, they deny that climate change exists. They want to get involved in the content of what scientists are looking at, which I think is very counterproductive. Uh, and so a lot of those battles, we, we feel like almost sometimes that they're anti-science. So, so, I mean, what's it like sitting on, in those meetings? Are you just, you know, biting, biting your tongue? <laughs> well, sometimes it's fast. We got, a, we got a live link to the space station. That was pretty cool. Uh, we got to talk to people who were up there. That was really interesting. Uh, but sometimes it's, uh, it's so hyper. That's a more political. The, the Armed Services Committee is one of the least political committees in at least uh, partisan committees in Congress because we really have to get to the end. So we've done 50, the committee's done 53 straight military budgets. So that's, you know, everyone's trying to land that plane. The Science Committee has become very political. So, you know, one of the titles of the last, uh, the last uh, committee hearing was um, President Obama's coal policy, a failure from the start. That was the title of the hearing. <laughs> so it seems like they'd already had uh, an idea of what they wanted to hear. And, you know, you get people uh, arguing with the Secretary of Energy about whether climate change is happening. And so that can be entertaining if you have a good sense of humor or it could be a, it can, if you don't have a good mood that day, it can seem like a waste of time. So I was going to ask you what, what the uh, thing you've been most proud of getting through the Science Committee uh, or doing on the Science Committee, but maybe the real question is for, the, for, for, for defense. Uh, has there been anything on the Science Committee that you really felt like has been a real success and really helpful to either the region or, or the country? You know, the one, one bill we did, I did with uh, Larry Bouchon, which was, who's a um, subcommittee chair, he's from Indiana, Republican, I uh, wanted to look at the effect of congressional involvement in scientific content. Um, we really have to get away. I, I, I feel like it's a, what we've done, we have a, a really good system of empowering scientists to do basic research. So it's not applied, it's sort of looking at what's happening out there between molecules or, um, excuse me, beer break. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, there, we don't know what it will lead to. So, you know, this kind of research is what led in the Department of Defense in DARPA to the internet and to GPS. Now, we didn't commercialize those in the government, but those were, you know, those were scientists kind of just messing around, like think, what can I figure out? And we gave them an investment. We gave them investment funds. That's what happens also in Torrey Pines Mesa in biology. Uh, and, you know, we don't know. It's not going to lead to a product, so it's not something that a company is going to invest in who has to report quarterly to, to, to shareholders. But it's really how we've developed our lead, and it's also something we haven't gotten politicians involved in science, which sounds basic. Even when I was on the city council, one thing we really were careful of, we never interfered once with the rec in eight years I was on the city council with the recommendations of the Commission on Arts and Culture because we were not <coughs> arts artists and culturalists right we knew what our limitations were we got really good people to go do those work we, that work we got them funding out of the tourism funds but we let them do their job and for some reason uh, some of the folks in um, in in DC want to inject themselves into science I think it's very very counterproductive and very dangerous so, so there was a bill. So you were we weren't able to to back to back that off, but the bill we got was at least them willing to look at what the effect was on science of us doing that. So they're studying so yes, whether or not they yeah, should interfere. Yeah. This is not my greatest moment in Congress, <laughs> but in the science committee, that was pretty good. So, what what is your greatest moment in Congress so far? So I just say a, a few things. One is uh, we passed something called no budget, no pay, which is the idea that if if you Congress, if you don't do your job and pass a budget, you shouldn't get your paycheck. And that led to the first budget in two years in Congress, uh, which is what you need to stop shutting down the government. 
Um, working together, the five of us, and Daryl Issa has said that for the first time he's been in Congress, the, we've got five members of Congress who like each other and can work together. And I look, I don't talk to Daryl. You're talking about day, the five in the local five region. five in our region. We got uh, $226 million for border funding for the, to, for the next phase of the border infrastructure at San Ysidro with it a lower uh, weights. We got um, Duncan Hunter and I worked together to move an earmark from something. Remember Joe Wilson, the you lie guy? He's a oh, subcommittee yeah. chair. And he had just, he didn't, he didn't fess up to this, but somehow $120 million had been added to the project in his district that the military had asked for. Um, but uh, so we got that move to buy equipment in Poway that the Air Force actually wanted and supported 1,200 jobs. Um, we got a bill uh, that uh, was, was advocated by some of the builders here that would enable um, small businesses to compete for defense contracts in, easy, in an easier way. And even the Associated General Contractors thanked me for doing that. And then the big thing, I think, locally is the Military Transition Support Project, which is a way for us to match our community resources that help vets and active duty families with the vets who are transitioning out. Um, and it's become, I think, will be a national model. We've already gotten inquiries on that. So at least uh, one or two things there are very yeah. tech-related. The yeah. border in particular, yep. I mean, that, there, there's a great uh, collaboration there with, right. with, with, with the Michaela Doris. Um, I want to talk about a couple of, of, of the bigger technology issues mm -hmm. in Congress. Um, first of all, uh, USA Freedom. Um, this is, has, has the, the, the whole question of surveillance, <coughs> excuse me, government surveillance, uh, you know, where's the appropriate limit? Can you tell me, tell all of us a little bit more about, you know, where you stand on that? Where's that? Where's the appropriate line between, you know, protecting our country and protecting our individual rights? Well, you know, Ben, I think we're still looking for it, to be honest with you. And I think, I don't think we're going to get the answer. Um, so when I came in, um, after I came into office, we had the revelations from Mr. Snowden, by the way, about which... You know, some percentage of what he said was whistleblowing about the NSA. A large percentage of what he gave away were secrets that really compromised our, our security. So I'm not, um, I'm not going to ascribe any sort of heroism to him. But he did tell us some information about the NSA that I thought was important to us and I think raised a lot of concerns in a lot of uh, areas about um, whether that balance was right. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of bills to sort of... Um, well, anyway, there was a, we didn't have much of a discussion. We had a lot of discussion about it, but not a lot of lawmaking about it. We did end the metadata collection, which I think was appropriate. I don't think that it's appropriate for the government to have collected that information, even if you didn't know the content of those things. Uh, I thought we, it was appropriate for us to end that and not have the government hold that information. Um, but the other thing is, I would say that, you know, as a member of the Emerging Threats Committee, you do hear a lot of stories that make you concerned that, um, there's some, we have to give some uh, latitude for law enforcement to prevent some of these attacks. The kind of thing you saw in Boston at the marathon is a really serious thing. And so um, I'd love to tell you today that we could uh, prevent people from spying, um, you know, or at least like hold them to the Fourth Amendment standard that a police officer would have to. But I think that that's not going to be as realistic. I do think that, you know, using the FISA court, uh, empowering a public advocate was a good idea, and that's something that we've done. At least someone's arguing the other side. I think that's a big step forward. Um, I wouldn't say that it's done, but I, I would also say that the, that it's not simple, and I'd, I'd like to keep working on it to see if we can't can find the right balance. Fair enough. Um, I don't know if you uh, remember who Aaron Swartz is. Um, he's a young uh, Program. technologist, programmer, uh -huh. um, and one of the things he was working on was um, <clears throat> uh, making uh, academic journals publicly accessible, right. opening it up the data. Um, and he uh, ran into the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, uh, and was ended up getting charged with uh, up to 20, uh, 35 years in, in prison. Okay, I'm not, I don't okay. remember this one, Ben. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, so he, he ended up uh, committing suicide in early yeah. 2003. The, the, these were academic journals he was trying to release into the public, make um, 
And unfortunately, federal prosecutors really threw the book at him. So there's, there's two pieces of legislation um, uh, that, that, that have been introduced since then. Uh, the first is, is Aaron's Law. Mm -hmm. um, actually, let's see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, so Aaron's Law. It's a joke asking this crowd for a pen. That's going to happen. Here, I got a pen. Thank you. Um, should have pulled this up first. Um, so uh, Aaron's Law was, was introduced by Lofgren. Um, and um, it excludes uh, term, thank you, uh, terms of service violations from the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing, since you're not familiar with this, so I'm, I won't ask you to, to take a position on it. Yeah, well, let me look at it. And okay. What I'd like to do, by the way, I was saying to Ben beforehand is, we haven't had this discussion yet. We actually had a group, uh, Seth and some people came to my office to talk about um, uh, the open internet, um, but we should have, we should consider this part of a continuing dialogue, assuming you want to talk to me after November 4th, <laughs> but, um, but I would like to, to uh, consider this uh, part of a continuing dialogue. So I don't know this one, but I'll look at it. Okay. So the other one, uh, sometimes referred to as others, uh, Aaron's other law, <laughs> okay. um, is, is the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act. And that's a bill that, that, that mandates uh, earlier release of uh, taxpayer-funded research. Is that Lofgren's bill, too? Yes. Okay. We had some discussion about that, too. So um, I, I will... Um, but you don't have a position you. on it yet? Uh, we... Um, I don't think we ever it ever came to a vote. Okay. But let me promise you we'll have a discussion before it does. So th th this, this sort of raises a, a, a bigger question about where our money is going, mm -hmm. where, where taxpayer funds are going. And, and you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and segue this into a conversation about healthcare.gov. Okay. So A rousing success. <laughs> well, you know, whatever you think about the, the, the bill and, and Obamacare, uh, the website was obviously an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to get into a little bit more of, of, of the disaster and how that happened. But first of all, one of the things that, that struck me in this was the federal government did, did a site. Many states did their own site. Every one of these is closed. Every one of them is, 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 is proprietary software that they haven't released. So we have... I don't know how many states it ended up being, 20, 30 states, all building the exact same thing and not sharing with each other. Well, it's ridiculous, too, because some of them have done it well and some of them have been abysmal, like Oregon's Oregon, terrible. Oregon, absolute disaster. I think Maryland was terrible, but... Um, Kentucky. But, sorry? Kentucky, I heard, was great. Kentucky's great, right? And so um, it, it frustrates me, too, because this is, again, this is a little bit cultural in D.C. There's not a sharing mentality. <clears throat> Um, and, and when you would do Code for America, you would go volunteer to fix it over a weekend, and they would think, you know, what are they after, right? And so um, I agree with you. It was very frustrating for me to see that happen, and uh, particularly, you know, then, of course, he flew someone out from the West Coast to fix it <laughs> from Microsoft, right? Which, you know, you could have thought of before. So... Um, you know, I really don't think that, that there's any excuse for it, but I hope we learn from it because uh, we obviously could do a lot better. So one of the things uh, I'm, I'm wondering is, is I, I, know the, I know the Department of Defense, and you've probably experienced this a little bit, is using open source more and more. Okay. And, and part of the reason they use it is, is uh, they, well, it's more, they find it's more secure. Right. They also find it's cheaper. Right. Um, can we take that, that, that attitude of, of using open source software from, the, uh, this is bizarre to say, from the agile Department of Defense and bring it to the rest of the federal government? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, do you, have you, found, have you been, had any success dealing with it at a local level? We're, we're, we're seeing some big successes in the okay. local level. Um, and, and the Code for America is, is doing this a lot. Um, uh, they have a fellows program where they, they, they uh, put uh, developers in different cities and counties, and all the software they develop is open source. Um, it, there's certainly a lot, of, of, uh, lot more that needs to be done locally, mm -hmm. but um, definitely seeing more of it locally than I'm seeing on the federal level. I think that you know, the interesting. There's such a defensive mindedness about the government. I think that there's that the what what the open source. Uh, approach offers is there's a lot more efficiency, there's a lot of opportunity to save money. 
uh, and um, I don't know if you if if you have advocates uh, for that yet in probably Jared is is Jared Polis, yeah. So I, I would uh, be happy to look for ways to join with him and see if we can do that. Um. So let let's stick with healthcare.gov for a second. Um. So obviously an an IT procurement disaster. Yep. Uh, certainly not the first. Right. Um, certainly not a federal issue only. We, we, we've seen it right. on the state level. I have uh, another one that really is bugging me too, but go ahead. Go, what, what? There's a, a, there's a um, uh, electronic medical record system for the Department of Defense, and there's an electronic medical record system for the Veterans Administration. And you know what? Every single veteran comes from the Department of Defense. So why you, now? So we've got two systems that don't talk to each other, and you know you you could in a, in a different world is you'd sign someone up when they're 18 and they enlist, and then you'd follow them through to the celestial retirement all in one one system. Um, and there's something everyone agrees we should do it, but no one knows how to merge the two. Another example of something where we could you know we could use some IT wisdom. Well, uh, so. Um so the the healthcare.gov one, the, the primary contractor on that was CGI, okay. um, who also here in San Diego is one of our big contractors for the city. Uh, yeah. For the city, um, you know, I look at that and and I go, after that disaster, should any government in in the country use them for anything ever again? Right. Um, <laughs> I, I know personally, uh, if, if the, in, in being a business owner, I had a vendor who delivered that poorly. I certainly wouldn't uh, right. use them or recommend them to friends. Yeah. One of the really frustrating things about procurement law, which we ought to talk about, this happens at the city too, is it's very, very difficult to disqualify a contractor uh, unless they've been dishonest. So, you know, we have all these road contractors at the city that we hated to use. But you had to go through such a process to knock them out of the system because it was public work. Um, so I'd love to look to help you look at that too because um, the other thing, the other challenge you have is it's easy to tell if someone botched a paving job. Mm -hmm. It's hard for the ordinary person to tell if they botched a technology job, right? J I mean, you could tell. Well, healthcare.gov on, on a certain be easy level. To tell, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was kind of a uh, I, I hate to say this, but it was kind of a positive in that. Finally, it got yeah. some clear eyes on 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 the right. failures in IT procurement. Right. Um, so, is this a, the something for the the Science and Technology Committee? Is there some other department uh, uh, um, committee that this should go through? How do we get IT procurement reworked? How do how do we start bringing in smaller vendors? How do we start disqualifying the CGIs of the of the country? We are looking at procurement in the Defense Department. Uh, that seems like a pretty big uh, meal, um, and I I don't know that that would run across the the, um, the government because there's particular security concerns with the Defense Department that make it probably it has to more be complicated. It's a dot mill thing, right? So um, we are going to try to work on that, we, and we found you know one of the things this is a, a technology thing we were we found out about was that they were they buy satellites satellite space like it's a car, a durable good. And we finally convinced them in this defense bill to lease it because it's it's so, it changes all the time, right? And it's be like, you know, you, I'm gonna buy an iPhone and keep it for 10 years. <laughs> no one does that, right? That's just not the way you do it. Right? You do it <laughs> you got a pretty old iPhone. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, I'm trying to, we're trying to bite that, bite, bite that, that elephant, uh, or chew that elephant uh, in the defense department, but. I haven't seen it happen um, uh, government-wide. Maybe that would be, let me think about how that would fit in. Um, have you been following 18F? 18F? Okay, see this is part of the education part. Is it a fighter? <laughs> it, 18F is F18, at, no. No, it's, it's not a fighter, it's not a singles profile. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a division of the GSA. Okay. Um, so what they did was they brought in a bunch of uh, generally West Coast uh, right. tech folks, and they've got a little a startup, uh, I think it's at the corner of 18 and F, that's the name, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they're doing uh, tech projects within, within the GSA and, and 
servicing uh, different departments and okay. really trying to bring a more agile, uh, tech-focused approach to a lot of uh -huh. solutions. So, so that's going to be your, your other homework okay, assignment. I will, I will <laughs> go visit them to see if they're happy. A um, couple other um, uh, issues to, to talk about. Net, net neutrality. Yay, nay. Yeah. And I'll just say, too, um, I had an issue. So first of all, <laughs> I signed a letter that um, contained a principle that I agreed with, but was sponsored by some of the telecoms. And so um, people drew the conclusion erroneously that I agreed with everything the telecoms want. But I like the 2010 internet order, open internet order. We've had this conversation. Um, and what I didn't like is regulating the internet like it was utility. Um, the way a utility works is that when you want to make changes, you have to go through this iterative process of asking permission of the regulator. And there's no guarantee that the regulator would come out with a good decision at the end. Uh, you know, whether it's the water department or the, uh, or, or the PUC or whatever. So uh, at the end, after talking to a lot of people, including some folks here, what I did was I introduced the bill to legalize the 2010 open internet order that had been invalidated on the lawsuit by Verizon um, as a way to, you know, to see what we could do to, to prescribe the right, to say, to say to the industry and to the innovators, frankly, this is the, what we want the internet to look like at the end. We want it to be uh, widely available. We want it to be open. We don't want people to be paying penalties because they're small. Uh, we don't want there to be preferences. Those were all in the 2010 internet order that was thrown out because the court said that the FCC didn't have the authority to uh, to impose those regulations. What my bill did was effectively give them the authority to do what they had done and restore that order without going to the this model of a utility where the government is saying yay or nay to what um, people who are frankly the innovators want to do. Um. You know, I, I have a couple other questions, but I also see we're running a little bit short on time. Okay. So uh, I wanted to, to go ahead and open it up uh, to the folks here and see what sort of questions we have from the audience. Um, so anything about technology, about open government, um, craft beer? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've got one. Yes. Hi, I'm Danielle from IBN, or Independent Voter Network. Um, so some argue that closed-door closed deals in government are necessar necessary in order for legislative action. Like, you take the Constitutional Convention, there was definitely a level of secrecy that the public accepted. Um, in today's political climate, does that argument still stand? Well, I think a general secrecy is rare. It should be rare. Um, you know, at the city, there's very specific instances where you can talk about stuff in closed doors. Like, you know, real estate negotiations, you can't conduct those openly. I can't tell, you can't listen to what uh, the city wants to pay for a piece of property. It, you know, it's bad for the public if everybody knows that. Uh, it's bad for the public to know kind of uh, in litigation um, what your position is. There's uh, There are privacy concerns involving indi individuals that have to be protected. But in general, secrecy should be rare. I would say that the one thing is, you know, uh, on a personal, I would, I would say we shouldn't be fearful of people developing personal relationships and, and, and trust. I think one of the things that happened in Congress, you know, you have to learn how to work with people. And um, I have to be able to listen to what you want. What is it you want out of Congress so we can think if we can work together to see, to see if we can both get what we want? Uh, and sometimes that'll take place over a dinner uh, over a craft beer, if that's okay with you. Um, and I would not be scared of those personal relationships being developed. What I find is that the business of the Congress, you know, wh when we do a defense budget, we go through line by line on C-SPAN exactly what we're talking about, and, and it's, pretty, it's pretty open. Um, but I do think that there's an important role, there's an important thing in Congress in, in terms of getting to know people and, and getting to... And, uh, getting to kind of see where they're, they don't know, you know, in almost literally where, where they're coming from, because it's a big country. Um, and, uh, uh, but in terms of doing the business of the government, that should be public. 
So, so yesterday, Society of Professional Journalists had a, uh, an event about uh, police body cameras. Uh, oh, yeah, are you in favor or against congressional body cameras? No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so dull. Be, uh, really dull. Uh, what other questions do we have out there? Actually. Okay. One of my biggest pet peeves is that I find it's really difficult for users, like lay people, to access information about legislation. Um, I mean, even you know when I bring, I, I looked at your congressional website and I looked at legislation you're sponsoring. It's not user friendly. It's not easy for me to read. Right. What do you think um, Congress can do to make um, the information sharing to the public about their activity and what the federal government can do for them more accessible um, to the public in the age of you know, changing technology? Well, Here's an area where I'm sympathetic and I would love your help, because I don't know how it happens that you get at this stuff. I mean, I know that there's this concept of open data that we should support and that, you know, that for some reason people don't like PDFs because you can't play around with them, right? It, right? No. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're very, um, very hard to analyze so and pull the data out of. I think we should be um, empowering input and engagement by providing this in the best format possible. What I don't know, Ashley, is is you know what the steps are to, to go from here to there. So we probably should be working on that together. I, I think that it will not come naturally to a bureaucracy because they don't tend to change on their own. But um, if you do have, if you could give me some some ways to um, advocate for the right kind of uh, interfaces and interaction and availability, I'd be happy to do that. So in the in the tech world, we we have a concept of uh, source control and, and, and change tracking. If you, you take a, that this helps avoid the uh, co the the cards getting all mixed mm -hmm. up. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> but you, every time you, somebody makes a change, it's tracked who made the change, right. when, and they're actually asked to put in a little note about why. Okay. Um, would you support a sim similar thing for as legislation goes through the process? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that makes that kind of thing makes sense, as I understand it. Seth. You had a question? I did. Uh, I just wanted to go back real quick to the net so-called net neutrality question. A uh, phrase you told me not to use anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I encourage us all to look into okay, right. why why that is. But um, to the to that point, um, you've proposed a, a solution, or at least a, a workaround. In, in the meantime, um, while you've done that, the FCC is considering. Uh, okay. What they're going to do already, right? I think we've we've gone past the last public input period right. on what the FCC is con is considering. From a practical standpoint, the FCC sounds like they're going to make a decision sometime in the near future. Right. You've made a proposal, and Congress, being what Congress is, do you, is there any chance that your proposal is going to? even really ever make it anywhere to be heard, or should we be more focused on trying to get the FCC to do something that we can hope is 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 in the, is it, that takes the position that we're more uh, friendly towards? Well, it's not either or, Seth. I think I would not suggest by any means that, well, I, I tell everybody, don't ever think that you should rely on Congress to solve your problem. I mean, this Congress is very difficult, and frankly, you know, uh, when I was a, the city council president, I actually liked to put stuff up for a vote. I like to win, but I also like to get through stuff, and that's not the ethic there. And so they hold stuff from letting you know the speaker decide what, what's come. The speaker decides what's comes what comes to the floor, and it's very frustrating that we can't get votes on stuff. So I would I, I would say we go double track. Let me try to work this um, uh, through the Congress. I think there is some sympathy for doing this because it would settle it. People understand it now. They've looked at it. I think even the telecoms would prefer the certainty of this rule that to, um, to you know, they're concerned about what FCC is going to do now, too. Um, so there might be some support in Congress, but I would certainly be vigorous in making sure that people hear your, hear your voice. And I, the, the good news, I think, on that side is that this has gotten the second most comments of any FCC action ever. And you know what the first one was? You know what the first one was? Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> Just when I was feeling good about democracy. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Those are your voters. So. No, but um, but um, uh, I think it's gotten a lot of attention. I, I don't. I don't think any of this is going to happen 
we take it very lightly. But I'll work my end, you work your end, and we'll see if we can come up with something good. Any other questions out there? Oh, uh, I have a question from Twitter, if you would like. I would yes. love a question. Because I, I should have started there. What would it be without a question <laughs> from Twitter? This question comes from uh, Ms. Lori Saldana. Oh, my God. You should have told me that first. <laughs> <laughs> She's asking about your, uh, a vote that you, that you took. Uh, yeah. Probably 10 years ago. I'm, I know. Very recent vote. Uh, HR 264, attacking public input and environmental review. Oh, I know that one. And she's asking why you uh, sure. voted yes, I think. Okay. Is that true? It is true, if it's the one I know. So I, um, first of all, I'm, I had a, you know, I'm very nervous about having 100% on any scorecard, because that's not me. But I got 100% from the League of Conservation Voters in 2013. But in, 20, in early 2014, they came up with a, uh, a idea that uh, the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, would be reformed to require that there would be deadlines. Um, you know, we have projects in the federal government that go on for eight years without an answer, and I think that's wrong. So my, uh, I voted with the Republicans to support imposing a two-year deadline on NEPA decisions, requiring everyone to make comments that are specific if they want to file lawsuits. Uh, I just think it's a fair process. And frankly, I think as a Democrat, I owe, um, I have some responsibility to try to reform these regulations in a way that's, that works for people. And so um, it caused a lot of consternation, and it's not surprising that Lori would be one of the person, persons that was concerned. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I thought, you know, I thought it was, it was the right signal to send that we have to, you know, we, we expect, we want high standards for environmental regulation, but we also owe people an answer. We owe, we don't want to get, we don't want to interfere with everyone's uh, business, and so that's what that was about. I'll tell her. Yeah, she'll, I'm sure. <laughs> you were live tweeting that response, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it may not satisfy her, but that's the best I got. Oh, um, there's not any other questions. Um, I have another oh. question, actually. Sorry. Um, so the open data policy, uh, it received unanimous support from the San Diego City Council. And so I was just wondering um, how you can see that policy improving things in San Diego. Um, well, you know, obviously I... Um, I've not been to a city council meeting since 2008. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I think this is a pretty good community for that kind of stuff. I think people, so people in the city council, I would say in general, want, to, want this to work. I would say also they probably don't understand it very well. So, um, I mean, I'm not trying to demean <laughs> anybody, but it's hard, it's, it's complicated. And, you know, some of us are, are over 30, you know. <laughs> Um, and a lot of this comes it comes naturally to people who are younger, but not as not as easily to other people. So, uh, I think you're going to have a lot of success here because people are interested in it. I would can I throw out one regulatory idea that I think is is a issue. You got now? the mics. Uh, as uh, one of the things that concerns me um, that I hope you'd be aware of is, you know, the city council acts in two in two ways. It acts as a legislature but also acts, acts in a quasi-judicial uh, fashion. So um, this happens at the Coastal Commission, too. You're applying a, a law to a particular set of facts, and people have due process rights, and they deserve to be heard, and you make a record, and the record is the basis for the decision, and the record is the basis for the appeal. Technology gives the ability for people to be communicating outside the record, and it could be very innocent, like a text message from the crowd to the decision maker, uh, saying, you know, did you did you did I hear did I hear that right? Or, but then it could also be, why don't you ask this question? And pretty soon that bleeds into testimony. And I think we should probably be imposing a rule now, given that we're in this age, that that's prohibited. Hmm. Those kinds of any any kind of communication in the context of a quasi judicial action, like a hearing on a permit. Uh, would would be prohi would prohibit any of these kinds of extra record communications. So collect the cell phones at the door. Well, I think you you know you can find what, but you can actually what you can do though is you can impose a penalty uh, on people who do that. And I think that would be a good disincentive. But like Jan's email stuff, like Jan wants. <laughs> but if you're emailing about the subject of a hearing and not, no one can hear it in the crowd, 
or if they're watching on the on the feed, that's really wrong. I think it's really wrong, and I, I think that's the kind of thing we ought to come up with a solution for it, whether it's a a fine or or something like that. But in the in that judi in that judicial setting, um, this is an open government, open uh, uh, you know, open, it's a sunshine issue. I think we should all be aware of, and I, I think it's probably um, only increasing. And so I, I would ask you to you to help uh, shine a light on that stuff too. Thank you. Uh, so in the last couple of minutes here, um, any last things you want to tell us about technology, about open government, about what you're doing in Congress, or frankly, you know, I think the what 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 we've been seeing is a little bit of an awakening, uh, an awakening of the tech community. Mm -hmm. We're more aware of, mm -hmm. of the importance of getting involved in government. Any advice for how we can be doing better? So two things. One is. Um, I work on three areas. One is the, is veterans. One is energy in the military, uh, and alternative energy in the military. And the third is the science and innovation economy. I'm trying to push, uh, as I said, basic. Uh, I'm trying to push um, investment in basic scientific research, just like it's keeping up the bridges. We can't keep our lead in science unless we we keep up keep up with it. We have to have an immigration policy that accommodates the uh, the need for high skilled workers. We have to have education policies that don't punish kids for going to college. We have to uh, lower the student loan burden. Um, we have to repeal the medical device tax, which is a big disincentive here. But the big thing is we have to also appreciate the role of innovation in healthcare. And here's a device uh, that's a San Diego device. Uh, you can monitor your glucose levels now on a cell phone. You can monitor your cardiac behavior. We're to the point now where the the phone might call the doctor and say, hey, I'm worried about Ben. I think he's going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and uh, right. that could save us, <laughs> you know, that could save us a, a, a cost of an office visit, ambulance ride, ICU stay. It could save Ben's life. But Washington doesn't really think about um, the role that technology could play in bending these cost curves. Um, in Washington, D.C., I have something called a slide rule on my desk, and I would show it to you, and you would not know what it is. <laughs> But when I was in 11th grade, we were doing these calculations on slide rules. Now, you would know what it is, right? <laughs> um, but it was this thing you slid and you had a little thing. I don't even know how to use it anymore. But uh, when I was in a chemistry class, a kid came in. Um, and, you know, my dad's a minister and my mom stayed at home. We didn't have very much money. But a kid came home with a, in a, with a $400 Texas Instruments computer. And we didn't like that kid. Um, <laughs> And we had a big discussion about whether he could use it on the test. He couldn't use it on the test. Uh, but but I'm, I'm about the youngest person who ever used the slide rule because of that innovation, which now is on your cell phone. All those calculations can be on your cell phone. If you want to get a little calculator, you can get a little plastic thing at Walgreens. It costs you less than $10 with a solar panel on it. It will do all those same calculations. Uh, my family saved up for something called the World Book Encyclopedia. It was very important in my family to have education. It was a big investment for us. We were in the world book. And remember, we had the annual update. We would wait for the annual update. It would be a book about all the things that had happened that year that had changed what was in the world. I mean, that's, that's, that's very yesterday now. I mean, and all that's happened because of innovation. Innovation is what really changed the cost curve. And so um, uh, I think that the, the big thing for us as San Diegans is to sort of continue to push that across the country and make sure that we can lead the rest of the country to do these kinds of things. In healthcare in particular, uh, it's, it's the innovation, the kind of innovation that's happening right here that's going to bend the cost curve. Um, and obviously, things like the healthcare.gov, those are all things we know how to do. So you, what you'll have in me is an advocate for, for um, empowering that and, and um, showing it off. And uh, I know it's not a campaign event, but if, if you like that approach, I hope you'll send me back. Well, thank you so much. Thank okay. you for thank taking you. the time. Um, and uh, good luck for the last couple of weeks here. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you.